Good evening, everybody. We're about to start the biology core science part two hangout. If you're visiting via Frog, if you just want to post your name, and as we go through, I'll try and answer as many questions that come up as we go along. Remember, this is being recorded, so you can watch this at any other time. So let's take a look at the second part of biology. Now, for today's session, we're going to be looking at the following key concepts. We'll be looking at the environment, DNA, and finally, life on Earth. All the other content has been covered in the previous Hangout. As always, we'll be going through some questions at the end of each topic. These are questions taken from previous past papers, and hopefully you'll get a feeling for the type of question that they like to ask. So, let's start with topic one. Now, topic one is all about adaptations. Specifically, how animals can survive in particular environments. So the key here is that animals are found in lots of different environments and animals that are successful are adapted to these. They're suited. There's something about them that makes them good at surviving. Now, if you look at the key things with any animal system, there's competition. Animals are competing with one another, either between species or within the same species, for resources. That could be somewhere to live, it could be food, it could be for a mate. When we look at animals and their adaptations, we also need to be aware of, is that particular animal a predator or a prey? Because when we come to talk about the adaptations that these animals have, this will become important. So let's take a look at some given examples. You need to be able to talk about any particular animal and the adaptations within, but there's a few key principles that we can look at. So the first is if an animal is somewhere, lives somewhere, but it's hot, somewhere like the desert. Well, the key thing here is water. These particular animals need to try and maintain as much water as they can because it's scarce, it's hard to come by. The second thing, of course, is the heat. And thirdly, we might find, as we often is the case with a variety of animals, they need to try and have a particular way about them to avoid predators or avoid the prey from sneaking, from seeing them so they can sneak up. And so we call this term camouflage. So our classic example here, a desert animal, will be something like a camel. It's gonna have an ability where it can store water, it's going to have a very thin coat so it doesn't overheat during the day. It will still need a coat because at night time the desert will get cold. And finally, it will be a sandy colour. So for desert animals, anyone in hot conditions, water, heat and camouflage are important. Ways to adapt to try and keep water to lose the correct amount of heat and to remain camouflaged are crucial. Now the second part to all of this is if our particular animal is not in a hot area, but is in fact in a cold area, somewhere like the Arctic. And our classic example here will be something like a polar bear. Well, for this animal, water is less of an issue, 
but heat becomes really important. And so our polar bear will have thick insulation. It will have lots of layers of fat or blubber. It will have very hairy coats. It will also have a particular surface area to volume ratio, which is essentially very small. It's gonna keep the heat in. There isn't much surface area. And you can see in this particular picture here, it is still camouflaged. Our polar bear is able to sneak up on our unfortunate and unsuspecting seal. Now finally, with our adaptations, you need to be able to talk about plants. Something like a cactus, again, in hot conditions. So it's gonna have a small surface area to volume. It's gonna have ways where it's going to be looking at keeping as much water as it can. And there's gonna be other things for that. It's gonna be trying to have a way to avoid being predated. So they'll have spines on it. So in this particular organism, it's conserving its water this time with its small surface area. In other words, it doesn't have big open leaves. Spines to stop animals from eating it. And the last thing comes back to water. It's gonna try and get as much water as it can. And so its roots will be very extensive. They won't go very deep, but they will go out for a long way. Now the final part that we need to know for animals with adaptations is a word called extreme ophiles. Well, these are simply animals or organisms that live in very extreme conditions. It could be at the very bottom of the ocean, very deep down. It could be somewhere that is extremely hot near a thermal vent or somewhere where there's an incredibly low pH. Any of these conditions for most life would kill them. And so the term extremophiles is essentially an animal adapted to live in extremely hostile conditions. Now the second part we need to know when we're looking at the environment is how we measure any type of environmental change. Well, to measure change, we need some kind of indicator. So this can come in two forms. We can have living indicators, biotic. The ones to remember are things like lichens and insects. You don't need to know specific types of insect or specific types of lichen, just that some survive when the air is very clean. Certain lichens, which show us the quantity of air pollution, will only survive in very clean air. There are others that are less fussy, that will survive in bad air, highly polluted. And so, depending on the lichen present, we'll have an indication of the air quality. And the same applies to insects. There'll be some insects that like extremely clean water and will only survive if it's really clean. Whilst others are much less fussy. They live in very dirty water. And again, looking at what type of insect or what type of lichen is where will give you a clue as to the environmental quality. Now, alongside living biotic indicators, we have abiotic indicators, non-living indicators. Something that is gonna give us an indication of what the environment is like. And so these could be very simple. They could be temperature probes, which say if areas are increasing or decreasing their average temperature. It could be 
our count of carbon dioxide levels or carbon particles, which lead to things such as global dimming. And so, in combination with biotic living environmental indicators, the abiotic indicators, temperature, carbon dioxide, carbon particles, give us an overall indication of how the environment is doing. Now thirdly, when we're looking at the environment, we're going to need to be able to describe food chains and biomass. And specifically, we're going to need to relate this to population numbers. Well, very simply, a food chain shows us the energy transfer. The arrow is the way the energy is moving. So in this example, I've got some type of producer, some dandelions, and the energy within them is passed on to rabbits, which obviously eat them. And the energy within the rabbits is passed on to a fox. And so a food chain shows us the energy transfer that is occurring. But you'll notice they're limited. They're only a certain length. At most, really, four, maybe five organisms long. And it's for this key reason. At every step of our food chain, we lose energy. Energy goes. It doesn't get passed into the next organism. So take this population here of rabbits. We've got ourselves a little bunny rabbit. And that gets eaten. Oh, goodness me. You can see I didn't pass. Right, it apparently gets eaten by a dinosaur. What's happening here? Well, if we put some numbers in, say this bunny rabbit has a thousand joules of energy, we're going to find that the dinosaur is probably only going to take about 10 joules of energy. The reason being, this rabbit will be losing energy before it is eaten by the dinosaur. So for example, it's going to be keeping warm. The energy required to keep it warm from this original thousand is going to be quite considerable. It's also going to be pooing. That poo won't, or hopefully shouldn't, find its way into the dinosaur. And so there's energy there. It'll be making small noises. It'll be trying to mate. And finally, the dinosaur, even though it'll probably eat this rabbit whole, it won't be able to process every single part of the rabbit. It will itself poo out bits of rabbit. So ignoring the fact that clearly dinosaurs and rabbits weren't around at the same time, in an energy chain, a food chain, we're not getting all the energy that potentially could be passed on. And so the phrase for a cow mooing and pooing is apt. It's keeping warm, it's making noises, it's passing excrement that we won't eat. And with that in mind, when we do farm, we never get all the energy. And so it goes back to this food chain. If you put in some numbers, if we had 10,000 joules of energy in our flour and our producer, we might find that only a thousand joules of this energy is passed on to the rabbits and eventually only 10 joules to the fox. And that's why we can't continue this indefinitely because we keep losing energy at each stage. Now furthermore, there is a term we need to be aware of called biomass. This is the biological material. Essentially, we take our dandelions, all of them in the system, 
and weigh them. We'd get rid of a water before we did that. And again, we'd take our rabbits and weigh them. And finally, our fox. And so we would have a pyramid of biomass that looks like this. It will always get smaller. This is in contrast to a pyramid of number. We could find a pyramid of number that looks like this. This could be a top bird predator. This could be another type of bird. Perhaps this is some kind of insect. This part looks okay. But here, this could be a single tree. If you converted that into biomass, a single tree is huge in comparison to the insects on it and the few birds that predate them and the top predator. But a number can look quite different to a biomass pyramid. A biomass pyramid will always look like a classic pyramid. So just be aware of that. So for the environment, for biomass, just remember, not all the energy within each food chain step is passed on. It is lost, mooing and pooing. Now, when we look at the energy in a system, we need to be aware of things that decay. Decay is essentially returning our nutrients to our system. If we didn't have decay, we'd have a huge buildup of dead animals and waste. And that would be a huge, huge problem. Specifically for decay, we need to look at fungi and bacteria. Now, fungi and bacteria break down dead animals and detritus, waste. Now, the key that you need to be aware of for that to happen is the conditions within. Specifically, we're going to need some water. We're also going to need some heat. And finally, we're going to need some oxygen. Without any of these three components, decay will be very slow or potentially not happen at all. It's why we can dig up a woolly mammoth and find that it actually, even though it's been dead for 10,000 years, looks extremely well. It's dead, but it looks like it could have died yesterday. And that's because it's died somewhere where the conditions are so cold, the bacteria can't break it down. If you fall in a peat bog, there's no oxygen. And so you won't be broken down. If you die somewhere such as the Atacari Desert, where it rains on average a millimetre every decade, there's so little water, bacteria and fungi struggle to decay. Now, the final part with all of this is the carbon cycle. The movement of carbon throughout the earth. It looks incredibly complicated, but actually there's only three main steps. We have our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's only one way carbon dioxide is taken out of the atmosphere. That is via trees and the process of photosynthesis. However, there are a couple of other ways to put carbon dioxide back. Any organism that respires, in other words, all of them, including plants, will have carbon dioxide being released as a byproduct. We also have combustion. Now, I've had commented how good a dinosaur I drew earlier and this is where we have a problem because if we take our dinosaur again dinosaurs in fact 
dead organisms over millions of years are part of our fossil fuels. And we are beginning to burn more and more of them. Before we were burning fossil fuels, the whole carbon dioxide carbon cycle system was relatively well balanced. But we're beginning to deforest and we're beginning, in fact we have been for the last few hundred years, to massively increase our combustion rates. And so we're beginning to find there's a build up of carbon dioxide. Now in the exam, you'll also be needing to explain what happens to dead animals. Well, don't forget, dead animals will undergo decay. Fungi and microorganisms, bacteria, will break them down. And just like any other organism, they respire. And so they will be placing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as they break it down. So we can look at a relatively complicated system which includes a little bit more detail, but essentially we've got photosynthesis, we've got respiration from plants and from animals and anything that is breaking down via the decay process. And then we have any kind of burning, be it from fossil fuels or from biomass or from wood. But don't forget, this whole system is the movement of carbon. And we go back to our food chain. The carbon that is absorbed by photosynthesis is taken into animals when they eat them. Glucose, C6, H12, O6, the carbon. And furthermore, the dead animals, the tissue, well, that's what the fossil fuel is made of. The hydrocarbons, the carbon from a dead animal. So that's the carbon cycle. Okay. Let's take a look at some typical exam questions. And as I said, with all previous hangouts, you might want to pause it at this moment to have a look at it for yourself, because as always, we're relatively tight on time, so I need to go pretty quickly. If you pause it, it will go straight back to the current point. So let's have a look. Students investigated a food chain in the garden. The students found 650 aphids feeding on one bean plant. Five ladybirds are feeding on the aphids. And again, you're using your highlighter in the exam. The biomass in the five ladybirds is less than the biomass in the bean plant. Why? We then need to draw a pyramid of biomass for the food chain. We need it labelled. And finally, the carbon in dead bean plants is returned to the atmosphere via the carbon cycle. Describe it. So, let's take a look. Well, first of all, why would biomass in the five ladybirds be less than the biomass in the bean plant? Well, the ladybirds are eating the aphids, which in turn are eating the bean plant. And so the ladybirds have two potential energy losses before they get the energy that was original. So, for example, the aphids might not digest all of the bean plant that they're eating. The aphids themselves might poo, and energy is lost that way. They might wee with urine. They are respiring, and some of that energy is for the actual mechanics of it. They're keeping warm. The ladybird themselves might not actually eat the entirety of the aphid. It might not digest all of it. So any couple of points talking about not everything being digested and some stage losing energy itself, be it heat, fire, poo. Now, if we're going to draw it, it's very simple. It's a pyramid of biomass. So we're going to find that the biggest biomass is in the bean plant. 
it's going to be reduced by the time it gets to the aphid. And finally, the smallest amount of biomass will be with the ladybirds. Now, for four points, we need to describe the part of the carbon cycle where dead bean plants are returned to the atmosphere. How's that carbon from something that's died getting back? Well, we're getting one mark for talking about a decomposer. It could be bacteria, it could be fungi. The decomposers are breaking the bean plants down. So they are causing decay. All of these microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, respire. And respiration releases carbon dioxide. Decomposers, bacterial fungi for one mark, are decaying. When they're breaking down the bean plant, they are respiring and carbon dioxide is lost. Okay, second question. Again, you might want to pause. The diagram shows part of the carbon cycle. Name the process shown by the arrows X and Y. Describe the plot played by the algae in the carbon cycle. And finally, in tropical rainforests, process X, whatever that happens to be, is much faster than in most other habitats. Why? Well, let's take a look. X is putting carbon back into the atmosphere and microorganisms are doing it. Well, we're not gonna be burning the microorganisms, so this must be respiration. Y is putting carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, but this is to do with fossil fuels, which we are burning. So this will be combustion. Now the algae are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This is the photosynthetic part. So we have photosynthesis by the algae. Essentially, they are taking in carbon dioxide. You can then talk about the fact that the algae will also respire. You can see that part here. But they're also going to be eaten. They're eaten by animals. The carbon is moving on. And when these animals die, microorganisms will decay them. And that will itself release carbon dioxide again by respiration. So all the clues are in this picture. You just need to describe what you're seeing. Now finally, in tropical rainforest, X, well, X is our decay, our respiration, but by microorganisms. Why is it going quicker? Well, in the rainforest, first of all, it's a little bit hotter than most other climates. There's lots of water. And there's no need, there's no shortage, I should say, of oxygen. So we've got the perfect conditions for microorganisms to decay our dead detritus. We can also argue, as we know, rainforests are incredibly rich in their life. So we could actually also say there's going to be lots of microorganisms. Okay, that's the environment part of this hangout completed. We'll just end on a six marker. I'm going to go relatively quick on this one. It comes down to our question using spelling, punctuation and grammar that you need to be aware of. And we're talking about plants and animals that are adapted in many different ways to reduce the risk of being eaten by predators. This is our key point. We need to talk about animals and plants, but we are talking about how they are avoiding getting eaten. So we might be talking about 
camouflage. Not so it can sneak up and prey, that's not what we're asking. It's so it cannot be seen, it's well hidden. It might be, such as this dart frog, it might have some extremely obvious colours. It might be really obvious, and that suggests, don't eat me. I might be poisonous. I might taste really bad. If we're talking about plants, we might have thorns or spikes to make it difficult for animals to eat. And then it could be classic parts for animal. Prey tend to have eyes on the side of the head. They can see a much wider field of view. They might have really big ears so they can hear things. So maybe a final mark or so would be for talking about the physiological side of the animal. It's got eyes on the side. It's got large ears. For a six mark question, we're going to need three to four good scientific points with a good spelling, punctuation and grammar explanation. Okay, part two. Part two is now looking at DNA, variation, reproduction. So let's start by the following. We're going to look at DNA more in year 11, but essentially, this is our code for life. It makes organisms what they are. And specifically for that, we find all the DNA in the nucleus of each cell. Specifically, it's found in chromosomes. The DNA is put in a position where it's carrying all of the genetic information within a strand, within these chromosomes. Finally, the only other word that might come into play are genes. These are small sections of DNA that code for something, that perhaps make a protein. Well, if we're thinking about all the different organisms on life, there's huge variation. But actually, there's variation within a species. If you looked at a class full of people, some would be tall, some would be shorter, some would have big hair, some would have short, eye colour would be different, skin colour would be different. So there's huge variation. And it's the genes, or specifically the DNA that each of us carry, that gives us this difference. We've all got slightly different DNA. Now, of course, we can be affected by the environment. An old phrase of nature versus nurture. The environment will, of course, influence how we are. And so genes, things we inherit, along with the environment, lead to variation. Now, let's take a look at how reproduction occurs to give us this variation. Well, the first type of reproduction is known as asexual. Actually, with asexual reproduction, we don't get any variation. It occurs in normally simpler life, something like a bacterium. And what a bacterium will do is it will replicate itself where we have two identical copies. Now there's advantages to this. It's very quick. You don't need to go and find a mate. You don't need to be thinking about investing in energy for finding a mate or producing the gametes. So it's quick, it's easy, it's straightforward. But there's a massive downside. These are identical. So if something comes along which destroys this original bacteria, it's almost certain to destroy the offspring. 
for replicants because the DNA is the same. If it can kill one, it can probably kill the others. So this is where the other type of reproduction becomes important. This is sexual reproduction, the fusing of a sperm and an egg. Well, we need two parents and each parent is giving half the DNA. So by nature, the offspring will be different. If you take two people, for example, my wife and myself, we have a small baby. Well, she has half the DNA from mum, and unfortunately for her, she has half the DNA from me. But actually, that makes her different from both of us. So we might find that a horrible disease affects me, and I end up not being too well it's not necessarily going to affect my daughter. It might be the case that she has got certain genes from her mum, which make her absolutely fine. Of course, we could be unlucky, and hopefully we won't find that. But sexual reproduction gives us differences. And that makes it really, really useful. If you took a litter of puppies, you might find that one or two are just slightly different. And if a disease comes along, rather than wiping them all out, one or two might be lucky enough to survive. But of course, sex is expensive. In terms of energy, you need to find a mate. You need to produce gametes. It's not as simple as asexual reproduction. But the advantage, the key advantage, is it causes variation. Now, when we talk about reproduction, it's prudent at this point to talk about cloning. Cloning is essentially asexual reproduction. The DNA remains the same. And there are four different types of cloning that we need to be aware of. The first two involve plants. We can look at a plant, perhaps there's a plant next door, that looks really nice. What we can do is we can take a cutting, a small bit of it. We don't want to cut the stem off, we're going to kill the plant. But if we take a small bit, what we can do is take that cutting and put it in the ground. And with enough water and some nutrients, it will eventually grow to exactly the same plant as the parent. And that's a very simple cutting. Slightly more complicated, but in principle the same thing. We can actually do a tissue culture. The principle is the same. We take a small cutting of a nice parent plant, and we take that small cutting and we make it into incredibly fine, smaller and smaller and smaller cuts. We then put that in a particular growth medium and give it enough time, you'll end up with identical flowers or plants. And so when you buy plants from Amsterdam or from the Netherlands, you'll find that there is a really wonderful parent plant one that looks amazing perhaps it's a really nice red rose and over the generations they will keep taking small cutting and keep growing them and taking cuttings and growing and as long as no disease comes along to wipe that out our flowers can look great now we can't do the same with an animal we can't just take perhaps a nice Labrador and go, wow, I really want to copy that. 
I'm just going to cut the foot off and plant the foot. Clearly, that's not going to work. But there are ways that we can clone animals, and we're going to learn two types. The first type is an embryo transplant. Now, with an embryo transplant, we do the following. We take the sperm of an animal that we know is really good. And then we find, from that particular one, we get ourselves from a female, an egg. And what we do with this is we allow natural fertilization to occur. However, at the very early stage when an embryo has formed, we take the egg and we split it. And we can do that a few times. The DNA doesn't change. It's still half the DNA from our particular organism, from our femur, and it's half the DNA from our prize sperm, but we keep splitting it. And so each embryo is actually identical. We've got ourselves a different offspring, but each offspring is the same. And so all we do is we take these embryos, in this case, all six of them, and we place them into a surrogate mum. In fact, in this case, six surrogate females. And they would all give birth to exactly the same ideal offspring. And so we've got our best organism, our best male and our best female, and we've got complete copies of them. There is still a slight change here though, because technically this isn't a clone of either the mum or the dad. There's still been fertilization. If you wanted to completely clone someone, let's take someone like David Beckham. How do we do it? Well, the first thing we would do is take David Beckham's normal cells, not his gametes, just a normal body cell. We would then need a donor female. The reason it needs to be female is we are gonna to need to take one of her egg cells. Now the egg cell itself will have half the DNA. But we're then gonna do the following. From the female, we're actually going to remove the DNA. So we've just got an egg, a very simple vessel. From David Beckham, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna just take the DNA out. We want to get rid of the actual cell surrounding. Well, hopefully you can now see where this goes. We'll take the DNA from David Beckham and place it in the vessel, the empty vessel, the egg. And now we have an egg cell with 100% DNA, but that 100% DNA is from David Beckham. Well, our final choice now is to take this fertilized egg, in essence, and place it into a surrogate mum. It technically could be the same female or it could be a completely different female. You'll end up with a baby that is genetically the same as our parent, our David Beckham. Of course, it might not be quite as good as football. It might act slightly different because the environment will have an effect on it. But this process, this adult cell cloning or fusion cell cloning allows us to get a complete replica. And we've done it. We've done it with a variety of organisms. We don't do it with humans. We're not allowed, and we'll come on to the efficacies of this in a minute. But we do it with sheep. Dolly the sheep was, in fact, the first mammal to be cloned. 
Well, the final part around all of the DNA is GM, genetic modification or genetic engineering. Now, essentially, with genetic modification or genetic engineering, we are taking DNA from one animal and putting it into another. But the key bit here is it doesn't need to be the same animal. It could be different species. An example might be something like a jellyfish, which apparently looks like that, but can fluoresce. Under UV light, it goes bright blue. Well, in principle, I could take a person that doesn't glow under UV light, and with special enzymes, I can cut the bit of DNA that allows my jellyfish to glow bright blue. I can then do the same on my person, find the bit of DNA that perhaps makes the skin pigment, and I can replace it. I can put the DNA into this particular person. And so they will fluoresce just like the jellyfish. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. It can't actually be an adult human. You'd need to do this at the embryo stage. And it's actually very, very complicated to do. But the principle is that, taking DNA from one and placing into another. Now, a good example of what we do is actually DNA for people who have an issue with insulin, diabetic people. We can take the insulin gene from a healthy human and we can place it into bacteria. Bacteria replicate really quickly. By doing that, the bacteria can replicate, 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 but they're actually replicating the insulin. Here on the diagram, this is our part of insulin, which we've cut out with these special enzymes and placed it in the bacteria. And so when the bacteria grows, we've made a huge amount of insulin. We no longer need to kill pigs, which is how we used to get our insulin. So all in all, it's a great way. But finally, around all of this, you need to talk about the positives and the negatives for both cloning and GM. Well, think about some real useful issues. If you have a plant that is really good food, but dies very easily, maybe in adverse weather, and you've got another plant that doesn't taste very nice, but always lives, perhaps you could take the genes from each and make some kind of hybrid, a really tasty crop that does not die, that the weather cannot cause issues for growth. So there's real positives because perhaps we can increase our food production. Perhaps we can make organisms more resistant. Perhaps we could put things like vitamin C into food. People in poorer countries that are unfortunate enough not to be given fresh fruit and vegetables, they can get vitamin C in something like wheat. Of course, for a balanced argument, think of the negatives. There might be safety concerns. Do we know all the genes that are going across? We might reduce biodiversity. Perhaps there's arguments that we shouldn't play God. Okay, let's take a look at some questions. The diagram shows a method of cloning sheep. We've got a white-faced male, a black-faced female, We've got a body cell removed from the male sheep. We've got an egg. There's a fusion process. We've got a clone and we've got a clone lamb. Give the gender and face color of the clone lamb. Second mark here, give our reason. And then finally, the fusion of the body cell came from a male sheep and the egg from a female sheep as an example of asexual. Why? Well, let's look at the gender. First of all, the gender and the face color of the clone lamb, well, 
The DNA has always come from here. So the gender will be male and it will be white faced. It's come from this parent. And that's the reason. There's no mixing of genes. It's a clone. And you might also say that actually the nucleus has been removed before we get the fusion. The nucleus from the egg has gone. Now, the fusion of a body cell from a male sheep and the egg from a female is asexual. Why? Well, it's because there is no mixing. The nucleus has been removed. And so the only DNA from this particular animal was the male DNA. We've had genes just from the male. There is no mixing. And so the nucleus removal allows this organism to only become the cloned lamb. Now for question five, we have a picture of a zebrafish. And scientists have genetically modified the zebrafish to act as a pollution indicator. The genetically modified zebrafish has a gene from a jellyfish that allows the stripes of the zebrafish to change color. Describe how the scientists produced this GM zebrafish. So we're not looking at cloning here. Well, for three marks, we're going to be talking about the jellyfish having some genes removed. We need to say that we use special enzymes to do this. And finally, these genes are transferred into our zebrafish. So the three marks come from saying we take the genes from the jellyfish using special enzymes that we transfer into our zebrafish. Concerns? Well, perhaps the genes can transfer to other fish. Maybe they interbreed, we don't know. Perhaps our food chain in the wild could break. Perhaps these genes make this zebrafish incredibly dominant, or maybe they die out, and so organisms higher above or lower below will change. Perhaps the GM zebrafish will outcompete the natural zebrafish. A couple of examples from here would gain you the two marks. Essentially, there's an unknown with this GM. Okay, the final part. We're looking at life on Earth. Well, to begin with life on Earth, essentially, we have ourselves a tree of life. There was some origin of life, but has led to the development of every single living thing. There's always some common ancestor. A postulation brought about by Darwin, who we'll talk about in a minute. But when we're looking at life on Earth, we need to understand this word natural selection. We'll talk about evolution in a second. Well, what is natural selection? It's nature allowing some things to live and other things not. And it does it because life is hard. Let's look what happens. Well, first of all, animals will be slightly varied. There'll be variation. It could be, as we discussed earlier, because of sexual reproduction, but it could be if asexual reproduction is occurring, that there's been some kind of mutation. If we think about antibiotic resistant bacteria, MRSA, 
These are replicating asexually, but mutations have allowed for variation. So some kind of variation in our organisms. Well, in nature, there's competition. There's not enough stuff to go around. Resources are scarce. And because of that, if animals are slightly varied and there's competition, some are going to be better than others at survival. Some will die. The ones that survive reproduce. And so their genes are passed on to the next generation. The ones that don't survive are far less likely to reproduce because they're less likely to survive for a long time or clearly if you're dead you can't reproduce and so their genes don't get passed on and so we have ourselves essentially a mechanism for picking the best life the best adapted life to suit the environment it's in variation there's competition and so only some survive, only some produce, reproduce, and that means only their genes are passed on. Now, this natural selection leads us on to evolution. And so evolution is essentially organisms changing over time, becoming new species because of variation and competition and survival and genes being passed on. But this took time to establish, and there were two schools of thought. The first, which we now dismiss, was by Lamarck. Lamarck says we acquire characteristics. What I mean by that is the more you use something, the more likely you'll develop it and pass it on. The example be something like my giraffes. If I've got a short giraffe that keeps stretching its neck, Lamarck theorized that over time that neck will simply get taller. And furthermore, a tall neck will be passed on to the offspring. It's like saying if I go down the gym and keep working out, my offspring will themselves be fitter. We dismiss that. A good idea at the time, but the evidence isn't there. Instead, we go with Darwin, with natural selection causing evolution. And again, we can use the giraffes. Darwin is saying that this tall giraffe, which is naturally slightly varied, can outcompete the short giraffe, and so it survives, it's more likely to reproduce, and its genes are more likely to go into the next generation. Unfortunately for the short giraffe, it doesn't pass on its genes, it dies out, and so short neck giraffes don't go to the next generation. Now with all of this, Darwin, who is widely believed now, because there's evidence to support it, had a real tough time when he first postulated this. It's because back at the time when he was talking about evolution, it wasn't accepted because the vast majority of people were very insistent on God creating the earth. Over the course of a few days. Along with that, at the time, there is very little evidence. And so it became very difficult for Darwin to get his viewpoints across. A few hundred years ago, the world was a very different point. So, religious beliefs, a lack of explanations, a lack of evidence made it difficult for Darwin to get his point across. Fortunately, over the last few hundred years, the evidence backs him up. So let's take a look at two more questions. 
the theory of, nat of evolution via natural selection was proposed by Darwin. Explain how it occurs, four marks. And it's only gradually accepted two reasons why. Well, like we've just said, we need variation, perhaps by mutation, perhaps just by natural variation. Some are more likely to survive. There's competition. If you're surviving, you're breeding more, you're reproducing, and so your genes are passed on. The key bit, variation, competition, surviving and breeding, genes passed on. Why were Darwin series not accepted? Well, we're undermining God, the religious beliefs at the time. We've also got a lack of evidence and perhaps the mechanisms of how actual life sexually reproduces are not known. Okay, our final question. The picture shows a modern swordfish. Ancestors of swordfish had short, short sword, swords. Modern swordfish have long swords. They use their swords to injure prey. And then the prey are easier to catch. The information in the box shows one theory how the length of the sword of swordfish changed. The sword grew longer as each swordfish used its sword more and more. Each time a swordfish reproduced, the longer sword was passed to its offspring. Which scientists suggest the theory in the box? Well, this is acquiring characteristics. The more you use it, the longer it gets, and so it's passed on. So this would have been a theory from Lamarck. Finally, Darwin suggests that evolution is a result of natural selection. Describe how natural selection could result in modern swordfish with long swords developing. It's exactly the same as the last question. We've got variation in offspring. If you've got a longer sword, you're gonna get more food. If you've got more food, you're gonna survive. You're gonna reproduce more. And most importantly, you are gonna pass on your genes for a long sword. Hopefully by this point, you realize the type of question that they're going to be asking in the paper. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're end. Again, as always, all of these hangouts complement the use of revision cards, Brainscape, the CGP books, going on to nodes with science with past papers, looking at other revision videos, revision monkey, and again, speaking to friends and family, going through the content. I'll remain on Frog for a little bit longer if you've got any specific questions, but I hope you found that useful, and I hope you have a nice weekend. Goodbye.